end. And it will also um, be live streamed to Facebook, which will uh, be starting in just a moment, um, just while we're again waiting for folks to, to join us. We're just going to give it another, you know, 10, 15 seconds and um, then we're going to go ahead. Okay. All right. I think, great. I think we're good. I see that there's still some people uh, joining in, but we are um, starting the live stream. So welcome to everyone who is joining us on Facebook. Uh, we're really happy to have you all here. Um, we're really honored to be hosting this event um, with uh, Dr. Catherine Shear um, of the Center for Prolonged Grief. Um, we are um, going to get started uh, in the interest of time. Um, uh, okay, so this event is hosted by NAMI NYC, the National Alliance on Mental Illness of New York City. It is uh, titled Understanding Prolonged Grief Disorder and Its Treatment. I'm going to start um, off by saying a few words about NAMI NYC before I turn it over to our speaker. Um, we are a grassroots mental health organization. Um, our mission is to provide support, education, and advocacy for all individuals and families impacted by mental illness. That means that we provide uh, support groups and classes and other services free of charge, currently over Zoom, but hopefully very soon in person as well. And we provide support groups and education and other services, both for people who are dealing with mental health issues and also for people who are supporting someone who is dealing with a mental health issue. We know that it can be really challenging to provide that support and to um, provide that support effectively, even though we also know that that support is so important. So we want to make sure that um, folks who are providing that support to people in their lives who may be struggling um, are also getting support for themselves. Um, we, uh, you can find out more about all of our services by going to NAMINYC.org. Um, or by calling our helpline, um, and we're going to put that information in the chat very shortly. Um, but that phone number, if you'd like to take a note of it, is 212-684-3264, or you can email us at helpline at namiNYC.org. Um, the last thing I want to note about our programs and services is that everything is um, peer led. So our support groups for people living with mental health issues are facilitated by people living with mental health issues. Our support groups for family members are facilitated by family members. Um, so our goal is to provide um, education and support um, for, again, for anybody that's struggling or who's supporting somebody that's um, struggling. Um, I am going to be moderating the chat. Um, I would, we are going to be saving Q and A for the questions and answers for the end. But um, please do feel free to introduce yourselves, um, say where you're calling in from. It's always really cool to see the range of places that people are joining us from. Uh, and I will definitely be keeping track of any questions that pop up in the chat to share with our speaker at the end of the presentation. So um, with that, uh, for this um, webinar, we are really honored to welcome Dr. Kathy Shear, the director of the uh, now called the Center for Prolonged Grief, uh, who has developed a time-limited therapy for prolonged grief disorder that has been proven effective in multiple NIMH-funded studies. And we're really honored to have her here sharing her expertise. Uh, Dr. Shear, I don't know if you can see the chat, but there are folks calling in from Australia, Seattle, Tennessee, um, as well as uh, plenty of folks from New York City and uh, New England and New York State. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Shear. Thanks so much, Clara. And thank you so much for inviting me to talk this evening. I've, I've actually known about NAMI. I've known of NAMI and, and um, 
gotten resources from NAMI for over 30 years, maybe 40 years. And it's really a pleasure to actually be here working with you this evening. So thank you again for inviting me. And it's, and it's a special pleasure to introduce you in the audience to prolonged grief disorder and to tell you a little bit about the treatment that we devised and then tested as, um, as Clara just said. So I've put this in the way of my, there we go. Okay, so on September 23rd, just a, a little over a month ago, was it a month ago? Two months ago, almost two months ago, the American Psychiatric Association issued this press release um, announcing really that prolonged grief disorder is going to be added to the DSM-5. So it's, it is the newest disorder and it's, only, it's also the only disorder so far to be added to DSM-5 since 2013. And it, it was added because there are decades of studies and we have been very honored to have participated in many of those studies and in the process of getting this disorder recognized. Um, and so it's, it is, again, it's going to be in print, as this slide says, in March of 2022. But it is, as of now, officially accepted into the into the DSM-5. So I want to tell you this evening about what this condition is. And there's, a, there's, there's just a lot of confusion about it because it has had a lot of different names. It used to be our center was the Center for Complicated Grief until just a few weeks ago. Actually, maybe a week ago, we, ch we changed the name officially. Um, and it's also been called um, persistent complex bereavement disorder, you might know it by that, or traumatic grief, or some people have called it unresolved grief. And there's also a lot of confusion about what actually grief itself is. So that's where I want to start this evening, to basically define grief the way that we define it at the Center for Prolonged Grief, and that's really similar to many um, many people who work in this field. So the first thing is that grief is a natural response to any meaningful loss. But what I'm going to be talking about and what all of our work has focused on is a loss of someone close that we love to death. So we're talking about grief as the response to bereavement this evening. But grief does occur in response to a lot of other kinds of losses, and perhaps we can get into that in the question period. The other thing that's really important is that a lot of people think of grief as an emotion, as a specific emotion. But actually, we, we think it's much more than an emotion. It's, it's complex and it's multifaceted. It has thoughts and feelings. It does have a lot of different emotions in it. And there are certain behaviors that we that are kind of a part of what we do when we're grieving. There, there's a physical response, a bodily response to loss. And there are, of course, spiritual and social responses. And it's really that whole complex that we think of as grief, not just a single emotion, because it, it really isn't, it isn't a single emotion. It's also, it, it also is more or less permanent after we lose someone close to death, actually. So it, so because death itself is permanent and because grief is the response to the loss of someone to death, we are going to always have some grief in our lives, but not necessarily what we think of as grief, not the kind of grief that we experience shortly after such a death occurs. So, so grief evolves over time but it doesn't do so in in stages. That's another, the, the idea of stages of grief is very, very um, popular in, in the, especially in sort of the media and other um, kinds of ordinary public places, but it really is not supported by, by any of the res research and, and, <clears throat> and 
thinking about grief, expecting grief to move forward in stages can be make it even more confusing. It's confusing enough to go through it, but when we try to expect it to go in stages and it doesn't, that makes it even more difficult. Another thing that's, that's kind of challenging about grief is that it is unique to every person, and, and not only every person, to every loss. So it's, it's unique really to every relationship. That's one way to think of it. But there still are some important commonalities, and that's, of course, what we're gonna be talking about this evening. So we're gonna look, we're, we're really focusing mostly on prolonged grief, and that's what occurs when certain kinds of natural coping responses that occur in early grief kind of get a foothold in our mind. And they, so they persist and, and have more influence in our mental functioning than, um, than is kind of optimal. And so that makes it harder to make peace with the loss or to what we, we speak of as adapting to the loss, which I'll say more about in a minute. So I wanna say just a little bit about what we consider to be the roots of grief or the origin of grief, because it's such a, a, an enormous experience when we have it. And so where does it come from? And I think the answer to that is we, we first have to ask the question, what is it that we lose when we lose someone close? And the answer to that from a sort of research scientific perspective we can find in an area of psychology that we call attachment theory. So some of you may be familiar with this, but attachment relationships in psychology are love relationships in real life. So that's really what we're studying here. And there's now been a tremendous amount of psychological and also biological, neurobiological research to understand what are now what it would have been called since about the 1960s, biobehavioral motivational systems, <clears throat> which are sort of ways that it's in our biology to seek, form, and maintain close relationships with a small number of people in our life, over our lifespan, really starting even from, probably starting in utero actually, and going you know, throughout our entire lifespan. And these are people who are rewarding to be with and who provide us with what's called a safe haven, meaning they're there for us when things are not going well in our life, when we're stressed, when we're threatened, when we have problems, when we need someone to help us kind of move forward or get or problem solved, that's a safe haven. And they're also our secure base, this, the sort of secure base from which we can go out into the world on our own or with other people, but doing things that are a little bit challenging. We can take risks, we can learn new things and grow and change and perform in the world. And the, the people we love are there as our secure base and they're, they're cheering for us, they're happy for us when, when we succeed and they encourage us to take those risks. So that's one of the motivational systems that is very, it really defines our close relationship. And the other one is the, the sort of mirror image or the caregiving side, which is, of course, if, we have, if we're looking for such a person that is rewarding to be with and provides us with a safe haven and a secure base, then we're also going to have to have someone there to do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the caregiving system is also in our biology where it's in our biology to want to take care of the people we love to provide them with a safe haven and a secure base also and so that's also very much tied to our close relationships and the third thing is what we call the exploratory system and that is that we are also really it's very biologically motivated it's, it's kind of just who we are is to be motivated to go out and explore the world and learn new things, not necessarily to climb rocks as this person is doing. Um, certainly that wouldn't be something I would ever do, but you know, just that's, the idea is that we, we explore the world in all different way, <clears throat> ways and we do that when our relationships are stable, when, when they're basically in good shape. And so all of these systems are going to be affected 
when someone close dies. And so I want to tell you a little about how they're affected and then, and that's going to be the one of the foundational ways we're going to understand grief. So basically what happens is that when something threatens our attachment relationship, that activates this whole sort of biology of, of wanting to seek and form and maintain relationships of this sort because all of a sudden we don't have someone there that we that we really want and need. And the same thing happens to the caregiving system, but the exploratory system, which functions so well when the, the attachment and caregiving systems are stable, it gets inhibited or shut down. So this is what it basically looks like. We have, we have <clears throat> attachment insecurity. That just means that we have separation anxiety and we try to, and we, we feel like we want to find that person. We have a strong urge to find that person, to be with them physically, proximity, seek proximity to them, seek physical and mental proximity to them. And we, it's very similar what happens in the caregiver side, although we might feel more separation guilt. In both cases, we can feel guilt or anxiety, but we feel a lot of, of activated emotions. This is right after someone, you know, we, we lose someone or we don't know where they are. And then that exploratory system is going to lead to, it's shut down, it's going to lead to loss of any kind of interest in learning anything new or discovering anything new. And also, this is where our feelings of competence come from. So all of this, if you look at what what acute grief looks like, what grief looks like right after someone passes, it's going to map right onto this. And I'll show you that in, in just a minute. And so one of the things that we like to say at the Center for Prolonged Grief is that grief is the form that love takes when someone we love dies. And that isn't always what we think about grief, but it's very, very important because one of the things we're going to be really, really emphasizing is that there is nothing, there's nothing wrong with the way that we grieve. Even, you know, we're talking about prolonged grief disorder as now being a DSM-5 diagnosis. And it, it is called grief disorder, but actually what it really is, is a problem adapting or adjusting to the loss, coming to terms with the loss. It's not the grief itself that's a problem because grief is what it is. We'll talk more about that. So the other way we learned that grief was a form of love was from C.S. Lewis. And this is from his famous book, A Grief Observed, which is a, um, it's kind of like a, a, a small journal of sorts of how he felt after his wife died of cancer. And he, every day he wrote little things in this journal. We don't know what the time frame is, but this is one of them that I think is very beautiful and in which he makes the point that, that I think the important point that, that loss or bereavement is not a, what he calls a truncation. It's not an end of the process of love, but one of its phases. It's not the interruption of the dance, but the next figure. So that's really the idea that this is really, grief is the form love takes, that grief is the next form after someone dies. But that's not all it is. We, we know, actually everyone knows, that loss of someone close is one of life's most important stressors. It's one of the things that really throws us and that's, that's just very natural again. So that means that the response to loss is also, we can also talk about it as a stress response and it certainly is that as well. That means that it's going to cause physiologic changes of a stress response. It's going to activate a lot of very painful emotions, a whole range of different painful emotions, and, and, and a lot of, of distressing thoughts. And this is all going to be related to the loss itself, but also the other many other challenges that almost always accompany such a loss. And they're listed on this slide. I'm not going to read through them all, but you get the idea that there's that the stress is is very importantly the loss of the person, but also all of the things that also are stressful around that loss. And in, on top of the things 
that are stressful. Grief itself is often stressful because it's very powerful and it's complex and we don't always understand it. Most people feel kind of um, it, it, it kind of disconcerted by it because it's an unfamiliar kind of feeling. And one of the things about it is that there's often confusing thoughts and mixed feelings. So, so grief is very painful and it's, it's um, kind of takes over our life and we want it to go away, but then there's a way that we feel like it's all that we have left of the person who died. And so we want to hold on to it at the same time. We want to be free of that pain, but sometimes we feel like we really should be in pain also. We want to move on in our own life, but we don't want to at the same time. We feel a need for other people, but it's very, very hard to connect, to feel connected to other people during this early grief period when grief is really intense. And we also don't quite get it. We know the loss is real, but it's really hard to understand that. It's hard to comprehend how someone that we love so much, often someone we've been with for a long time, maybe all of our life, all of a sudden isn't here anymore. It doesn't make any sense. So we know it's real, but we have trouble understanding it. And we, we of course, crave that closeness to the person who died. But at the same time, part of us wants to avoid any reminders of the loss because they're so painful. And in, sort of similarly, we, we, we don't want to stop thinking about the person we've lost or whatever, if, if it's something else even, but we don't want to stop, talk, stop thinking about that person we lost. But then at the same time, we feel very frustrated because the thoughts are all we have and we want so much more. So grief is the form love takes and it's very stressful. And also important losses permanently change the world that we live in. And you know, I think that's something that people realize very quickly that our internal world is, is really shifted. It's, it's not the same and it's never gonna be the same again after we lose someone close. And the outside world also changes in important ways. The social world changes in important ways. And some, sometimes the, the sort of physical environment, even the, our um, finances might change importantly. So there lots of things can change. And what we have to do when, we, when, when things change in our life is we have to adapt and we do adapt because actually living things that's one thing that probably characterizes most characterizes all living things is that we adapt that they adapt and so adapting is also a positive thing it's going to help reduce the stress and it's also going to allow us to start to grow and learn and it will happen actually it will happen naturally if we don't get in our own way and there's a wonderful there's a wonderful quote in a book called strangers to ourselves that was written back in the 1980s by someone named Timothy Wilson, who is interested in, in kind of some of this out of awareness kinds of, of mental functioning that goes on. And he, he describes his, his good friend, Carolyn, whose mother died very suddenly, and she was totally distraught and convinced that she would never she would never feel okay again. And what he writes in that, in that story is that um, she was right, that she was never going to feel the same again, but she actually was back to herself a lot sooner than she would have expected and maybe even other people around her would have expected. So in a matter of several weeks, maybe weeks or months, but in that maybe in the first six months or so, she was back to herself and that kind of surprised her. But that's what the system does. It, if, it, if, if we can feel like it's just hopeless, but it actually isn't. And our bodies and minds will naturally adapt unless we get on our own way. And that's actually what, what is going to happen with prolonged grief disorder. So first, I want to just make a couple of other points before we get into that. And one of them is that this idea of coping with stress and adapting to change, we often think of them as interchangeable and, and they do relate to each other. Often what's, you know, the changes are stressful or the stresses are changing or, or manifestations of the change, but they are actually different. 
also. And so I think the, the images here show you really well what the difference is. So the, you can see the little the, the little figure that's holding up these these walls that are kind of crashing in on them um, is is having to do that really very directly, very deliberately in the moment and and really it's very focused what what they're doing is very focused on what's happening in what's happening to them, the stress or the threat or the pressure or whatever that's happening to them. And they're obviously using resources. On the right hand side, on the other hand, what you see is the emergence of the very beginnings of a new plant in a very desolate kind of landscape. And this is a very different kind of image because it, it's obviously been going on for a while, kind of under the surface. And it's going to be a long term process to really, really fully um, grow that plant, regrow that plant. It's going to be a new kind of plant probably than it was than whatever it was that was growing in this area before. And it's going to it's going to it's really basically building a new a new sort of way of living in this environment. So that's the kind of thing that we're going to be thinking of in terms of of grief being stressful, but also grief uh, loss bringing change that we're going to adapt to. And when we adapt to loss, what we mean by that is that we're going to be changing our automatic expectations and our automatic thoughts and behaviors to fit this new changed world. And when we look at that from a very big picture, high level, 30,000 feet perspective, what we can say is that what we have to do is accept the reality that this person is gone and they're not coming back. And as I said a few minutes ago, that's not easy to do because it's not even easy to understand it. And then we have to also find a way to make peace with it of some sort or come to terms with it. So that's a big deal. And then we have to also understand that because that person is gone and not coming back, we're not going to ever completely stop responding to that loss. We're not, we're not going to ever totally, um, say, resolve grief. We don't really resolve grief. Grief doesn't end. It just kind of moves into the background. And our relationship also to the person who died doesn't end because our relationships with people we love are very much deeply, literally mapped into our brains and our bodies. And so we you know, we don't lose that when they die, but that's all we have. And that's very different than having them in the world with us. So it's a very, cha it's a changed relationship. It isn't an end to the relationship. And we have to somehow understand that. And again, make peace with that in a way that helps us move forward in our lives. And then there are often other changes, many other changes that accompany that loss that have to do with with um, the way that we think about the world, the way that we think about ourselves, the way that other people see us, the way that other people accept us into their groups and all kinds of things like that. And we have to accept and adapt to that as well. So that's half of what we have to do. And the other half is we need to restore our capacity for well-being or for thriving, which, which is really undermined when someone close dies. And the way we understand what that requires is based on a theory called self-determination theory that was developed in the last half of the 20th century and put forward in 2000 by two social psychologists. And they basically said that we need to have a sense of purpose and meaning. We, have, we need to basically feel what they said was intrinsically motivated. We have to be motivated in part in our lives by things that we really care about, that things are interesting to us and things that we value. And that's how we have a sense of purpose and meaning and possibilities for joy and satisfaction in our life. We need to regain a sense of competence which, which we've lost really often because of the shutdown of that exploratory system that I was talking about a few minutes ago. And we need to have to regain a sense of belonging and mattering in, in our lives. And that comes from the promise of satisfying the actual having of satisfying relationships again. So if we reimagine grief based on what I've just said, 
we think of it as complex and multifaceted as a response to a major life stressor, the form love takes when someone we love dies, and a catalyst for and response to adaptation to loss. So let's now talk a little about what the experience of this is, because that's all very cerebral, right? So what do we experience? Well, again, the this response that's a form of love and a stress response emerges with strong emotions and very insistent thoughts, strong emotions of yearning, longing, and preoccupying thoughts and memories of the person who died, and accompanied by a whole range of other kinds of painful and also some positive emotions as we remember the person um, in their spiritual and social responses. There are grief-related behaviors that have to do with wanting to keep the person close, with wanting to honor them, to take care of their remains, to take care of them, of, of, of what they need. We all need something after we die, and, and our loved ones take care of that. And, and then also grief-related behaviors sometimes entail trying to avoid reminders that that person is gone. So complex grief-related behavior, strong emotions, insistent thoughts, and also a lot of bodily reactions. All of that is very, very prominent in acute grief, including often bodily pain, and also changes in heart rate and cardiovascular system functioning, heart rate and blood pressure, and, um, and immune system functioning also. And along with that, all of this, as we've been saying, is very stressful. And so we have some some sort of automatic early coping mechanisms that are listed on the right here. And they're important because they do help us early on. So one, part of it is that feeling of disbelief. And, and we almost always, especially if someone dies, suddenly we'll say, no, you know, this, this shouldn't have happened. This couldn't have happened. How could it have happened? We kind of protest it, naturally protest it. We imagine alternative scenarios, if only this person had been diagnosed earlier, if only they hadn't walked across the street at the moment they did when they were hit by a car, or there's just endless alternative scenarios that are very natural to start to occur to us. They, they really do very automatically do that. And mostly people will recognize them as kind of fruitless in a way, and only ways that we can in a way make ourselves feel worse because that is what they do because when we can imagine the death not happening it, it tends to make us feel worse because we know it did so most people will be able to set that aside along with with the natural self-blame or anger at other people sort of <clears throat> one person once told me that it feels like a mother lion that even no matter who died but you know that you that that side of you that really wants to take care of the person is thwarted and that can lead to a lot of self-blame or anger at someone else. Then a lot of people worry about grief and and then um, survivor guilt and the separation anxiety or guilt that we talked about before makes it kind of hard to it keeps us it keeps us focused on wanting the person and been being close to the person who died but it, it makes it harder to move forward, as does a very strong feeling of not belonging that most people have right after someone closed eyes. But as we accept the reality and restore that capacity to thrive, what we've called adapting to loss, grief is transformed, and we say integrated. In other words, we it finds a place in our life. So, so it doesn't stay so, um, so domineering in our minds. But it doesn't go away altogether either. But the you know a lot of what's what's so um, uncomfortable and and kind of unregulated about our life when grief is is sort of early when it's fresh when it's acute um, that sort of that sort of quiets down. So our physiology, the bodily changes are re-regulated. We so we. Our immune system comes back, our cardiovascular system comes back, we stop feeling that intense bodily pain. And the thoughts and memories don't go away, but they, they kind of move into the background where we can still think about the person if we do so deliberately, but they're not constantly on our mind in the same way. The emotions too, um, they're still there, but they become 
usually become bittersweet and definitely a little bit better regulated. So they're not constantly, you know, again, assaulting us. We don't, we aren't continually assaulted by grief, which we are in the beginning. And we start to be able to reconnect with other people. So all of that makes our lot makes it possible to move forward in our life in a, in a positive and meaningful way. But it doesn't mean that grief again is gone. And there are certain times we call them difficult times. And there are all kinds of ones like this, but a good example is this, upcoming time of year, the time of winter holidays, which are often family time, times and times when we're reminded of our loved one who isn't with us. And that can, that can trigger, that can activate um, a lot of grief again. It doesn't tend to last and it, you know, it's often a little better regulated, not quite as painful as the beginning, but, but it can be, it can come back like that. And there are other times it can, that can happen later in life when with certain kinds of life events or under, in stressful times, sometimes people will, will find themselves kind of having their grief about someone really important activated again. I found it happened. My mother died in 1998 and, um, and we were very close and, you know, I went through a period of grief, of course, and, you know, I'm basically, I can talk about her, I'm fine, you know, and, and she's still a very meaningful part of my life, but not every day. But um, recently I was asked to tell the story of her loss and I became really quite emotional telling that story. So that's the kind of thing that is very natural and can happen really to anyone. So this is, I like to draw pictures, so or at least graphs. I'm not, I'm not an artist by any stretch, but this is a way to look at all of this. Um, I'm not going to, again, walk through this in the interest of time. So um, this is what happens, though, when, let me go back to this one, one thing here, because, because these, remember, this is acute grief that we just looked at, and then these defensive coping um, mechanisms that we kind of walk through a little bit, they do, they're there naturally and they do kind of slow us down. So we kind of call them pause points because we, we kind of have to stop and say, well, yeah, maybe it would have been if only something or other had happened, it would have been different, but it really wasn't. So we have to kind of pause and remind ourselves that it, that's not the way it happened. And we kind of, we, 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 we have to find some way and we will find some way of dealing with what actually did happen. So. So, um, but the problem is sometimes that's really hard to do. It's really hard to set aside some of those early thoughts and feelings and behaviors. And this is what happens. This is really what we call prolonged grief disorder. When that happens, then, then these defensive coping responses are persistent and pervasive and they actually block this process of adapting. But in this slide, you can see the, the, um, the adapting itself and, and the outcome, which is the integrated grief, are still there. They're just kind of faded out because but they're still there. And that's an important thing to remember. So we all have the capacity to adapt to a loss. And this is, this is one of our basic premises is when we get into the, to the treatment and how we work with people. Um, so going back to the American Psychiatric Association, on the left-hand side of this slide, they describe prolonged grief disorder, which is, they say that it happens when someone loses someone close and, and the intense yearning, longing, or preoccupation with the person doesn't, doesn't sort of calm down. It doesn't move into the background. It doesn't sort of kind of, um, get the, the grief doesn't get integrated and what's left is again the, the intense yearning and longing and constant thoughts of the person and a feeling as though a part of oneself has died of course we all have that feeling when someone close dies and and it is often persistent but this is really this is in a strong troubling way the the sense of disbelief doesn't doesn't um sort of recede at all the avoidance of reminders that the person is gone is are also um, very, very prominent, along with the intense emotional pain, the difficulty moving on in really in a positive way. And we, I mean, we move on because we can't, because life 
moves us. I mean, time moves us. We can't stop time, but we don't we don't move forward in a positive way. We often have emotional numbness and a feeling that life is always going to be meaningless and and an intense feeling of loneliness. So that's that's the picture of someone with prolonged grief disorder, and it is extremely painful and debilitating. It really gets in the way of, of course, it gets in the way of being able to live your life in a, in a meaningful and um, positive way and to interact with people you love. And it's, it's really not, um, working is impaired. Um, it's, and there are sometimes phys- physical consequences of it as well. So that's the that's the picture of it. But on the right hand side, you can see that what the way we see it also is that this is not a completely different way of grieving than all of us grieve anyone close. Rather, it's a continuation of the natural acute grief, the natural intense grief and kind of domineering grief beyond the time it usually takes to come to terms with a loss. And so when we think of it that way, then what we have to do is, is take a look at some of those, find the whatever it is that's keeping it from moving forward, which is basically what's keeping us from adapting and then also facilitate adaptation. So I wanna talk first about the difference between the syndrome and depression and PTSD, and then we'll go on to talk about the, the, um, the treatment. So, Depression, we know, is characterized by sadness and what we call anhedonia, or that means, you know, loss of interest and pleasure, as you probably know. A persistent painful mood, a pervasive kind of guilt, which is often wide ranging, feeling guilty about all kinds of things, feeling like worthless as a person, ruminations related to that, those kinds of thoughts, and often suicidal thinking, of course, wanting to not live, motivated by feeling like we're, it's not, we don't deserve to, to live and or hopelessness about the future. Prolonged grief does have sadness and it does have some loss of interest and pleasure, but the, the core, the heart of grief is yearning and longing for the person who died. And, um, and that's accompanied by painful waves of emotion but they come and go much more so than with, with depression. There's, there's guilt, but it's usually either, it takes the form of either survivor guilt, which is that sort of uncomfortable feeling that you shouldn't um, really do things that are enjoyable or have fun in life because this person isn't here anymore, or, or the care, what we call caregiver self-blame, or taking, you know, kind of taking responsibility in a way, giving ourselves in a way too much um, power and you know as though we could have done something to stop this somehow Um, the rumination is more related to the loss alternative scenarios of the loss rather than um, rather than the sense of worthlessness of ourselves and suicidal thinking is there also and sometimes more prominent even than in depression there are some studies that suggest that suicidal thinking is is more frequent in grief, um, especially prolonged grief, than in depression. But it's motivated by not wanting to be here without this person, and or wanting to join them. Sometimes it's wanting to join them, but often it's just feeling like the world isn't okay without the person who died. So we also want to distinguish prolonged grief disorder from post-traumatic stress disorder because both of these are conditions that occur after a major life event a threat that's very threatening to us and they they both include what you could call intrusive kinds of symptoms um, certainly insistent in the case of prolonged grief and some people do call those intrusive um, thoughts and memories of the person who died and avoidance symptoms and also the kind of hyperactivation, the hyperarousal we see with post, post-traumatic stress disorder. We also see this kind of dysregulated um, physiology with prolonged grief. But of course, there's a big difference in the triggering event, which in the case of PTSD is, is something dangerous, very physically threatening. Whereas the event after bereavement is 
the loss of someone, the, also the stress reaction, the, the, the danger, in, for the most part, the danger is episodic. It, it occurs and then it's, it, it is gone after, if you survive something very dangerous, then the danger is over. <clears throat> Realistically, most of the time, it's over. But loss is really the beginning of something because loss is, is permanent. After someone is gone, they are not coming back. And so we have to deal with that forever um, moving forward. That's pretty different. The primary emotion is different, fear versus yearning and longing. The, thought, the intrusive thoughts are really related to the, the um, trauma or the event itself. And they're often flashbacks, whereas in prolonged grief, the thoughts are person related and they're not generally not intrusive or frightening. They might be a little intrusive, but they're very often they're also something the person almost wants or even does want. So it's they're very different kinds of, of insistent or intrusive thoughts. The avoidance again is based on a threat or fear and the avoidance where the avoidance and prolonged grief is more about the grief reaction. It's more it's more avoiding getting very, very activated, missing the person too much, avoiding reminders of the loss. And um, and so, again, the, and that's sort of how the reminders are different as well. Nightmares are common in PTSD and they're very rare. We, did, we actually did a study of this um, and found that I think 1% of the people in, in one of our studies um, that we studied this experienced nightmares, whereas almost everyone with PTSD has nightmares. Guilt is sometimes present, but it's very, it's very prevalent in prolonged grief. And that proximity seeking, um, sort of yearning and, and searching and positive re reminiscing are very common. And we don't see that with PTSD. And um, and the last thing is that kind of we, the way we think of it neurobiologically is also different, but we don't have to talk about that right now. So the last thing I want to show you here is the difference between different forms of grief, because people will say, well, what's the difference between prolonged grief disorder and regular grief, any, any other kind of, you know, whatever other, whatever you want to call it, we call it acute or integrated. And, and here really the difference that, so you, you, what you see in, there are two slides here, and I'm not going to read through these, but if you look at the check marks, you can see that acute and prolonged grief are very similar, but what's different, pretty different is integrated grief from prolonged grief, because Integrated grief and prolonged grief are in the same time frame, whereas prolonged grief is looking much more like the the loss essentially just happened. So you see that with the symptoms listed on this slide, and also the same thing here on this the symptoms listed on this slide. And if you're interested, this came from an article that I wrote with a colleague um, with a a. a um, patient that I worked with and also with a colleague in palliative care, and it was published in the British Medical Journal. So I did provide um, some cases that I think that sort of illustrate the difference here. And so I'm going to kind of briefly walk through these, but you will have the slides. You have, will have access to these slides if you want them. And so you can read this a little more carefully. But this is the first person is is um, Marion, who's a 68-year-old woman who has a past history of um, depression and who goes to her primary care doctor six weeks after the death of her husband from cardiovascular disease. And her doctor knows her pretty well, and he does see that she's, that she's pretty listless and withdrawn and feels like her spirit has been broken. And she says that the feelings, that these feelings of sadness began about a week after her husband's death and they haven't lifted at all, even when her third grandchild was born. She misses, she says she misses her husband, but, but she mostly, what she feels is empty and numb. And she describes her thoughts as boring and says that when she thinks about her husband, she mostly wonders why he stayed with her so long. Um, and her guilty feelings center around the idea that she's never been a good wife or mother and that she's really not even a good person. She has kind of a frightening sense of inadequacy and she worries about how she could, how she's going to manage on her own without him. 
she's having trouble sleeping she's her body is kind of slowed down and she has trouble diff, uh, concentrating and um and she's not really doing much and even though her her new her daughter who's a new parent needs her um and and she says that she couldn't help her but she'd just be more of a burden and she feels very helpless and hopeless and um and has this these ideas that she's experienced before that life isn't worth living and she keeps thinking that she can't function without her husband and it would have been better if she had died instead of him so she's clearly depressed but because her symptoms are occurring six weeks after the loss of her husband she's thinking that this is different from her prior de depressions and and kind of wondering if her feelings are normal after losing someone that she really loved and even her doctor is uncertain if this is grief or depression and wondering what he should do about treating her and this is really what's happening right now is that people are getting confused and because this actually is a pretty good description of a major depression it is not a very good description of prolonged grief first of all it's six weeks after it's not even a good um, description of acute grief really there's not a lot of yearning and longing there's not um, there's not a lot of the her preoccupying thoughts are more about her her own um, worthlessness and inadequacies so um, she she really would benefit from treatment for that depression she's responded to in particular to antidepressants in the past so it is reasonable to think that she would respond again and there is data in the literature that if we don't treat people who are depressed in this early you know few months after who really are depressed because not everyone is depressed who's grieving that's something very important to realize um, and if we don't treat it then it is more likely that she will end up down the road with prolonged grief disorder. So let's let's also, um, there, well, I'm, I think I'm not going to walk through this case with you, but again, this is Tony, whose father died very suddenly at, in a bike accident. And he wasn't very close to his father. He didn't, they, he didn't really, as he says, he wasn't my favorite person, but he wasn't supposed to die like that. It was horrible. And um, and so he talks about that, and um, he's having frequent nightmares of his father being hit by the car, and sometimes the dreams are so realistic that he feels like he was actually there to witness the accident, which of course he wasn't. And he's been having intrusive images of his father's body, especially if he has to process claims. He's a he, that's what he does in a hospital at the hospital where his father died. So. Um, so he, this is really a pretty good description of post-traumatic stress syndrome, but people will get confused that you can get PTSD after um, the death of someone close. You can get PTSD and prolonged grief sometimes, same thing with depression, but you can also differentiate them in these ways. Kate, on the other hand, is a pleasant 62-year-old woman who, who comes for therapy um, because because um, her her children have really said to her that she has to do this because she's not doing well and it's now um, four years after her husband died from cancer and she this kind of describes what she looks like when she starts to talk about her husband it's also the case that she's kept her husband Jim's office and tool room intact and doesn't let anyone sit in his favorite chair. She doesn't go out, she doesn't socialize anymore, and she feels kind of when she does kind of incomplete when she's with other people. And she also feels a lot of sadness, but also envy and anger about the fact that she's lost him and envious of other people. She spends a lot of hours in reveries daydreaming recalling how beautiful her life with Jim was and imagining being with him. And when she's not doing that, she often ruminates feeling angry and bitter about the fact that his cancer wasn't diagnosed early enough. She has, she does have intrusive images of his body, and but she's also mostly asking herself why she didn't figure out what was wrong with him before it was too late. And she, she just can't believe this really happened. She's avoiding reminders. Um, of him and of his loss and she wishes that she would have died with him 
She sometimes skips her medication, her antihypertension medication, knowing well that this could be dangerous. Um, and she, in a way, wants to die, but she's her religious beliefs it, you know, keep her from trying to take her own life. Um, so friends and family have told Kate that she needs to move on, but she thinks that it's not possible when you lose someone so integral to your life. Um, and again, her, her daughter insists that she comes for her help. And again, her Kate, Kate's therapist is puzzled, as, as many therapists today still would be. Um, they think she might be depressed, but it doesn't really seem like a typical depression. And she wonders if it, and the, the therapist wonders if this could be normal grief. And that is one of the questions that therapists will ask, um, because we do know, most people do know that everyone grieves in their own way. But this is a really typical picture of prolonged grief disorder. So let's talk about how to help someone like this, like Kate. And the, the approach we use centers on a concept of, of um, healing milestones as a way to move through that process of adapting, of accepting the reality and restoring the capacity for well-being. And so we have these seven healing milestones, and I'm going to walk through them with you now. And it, these are the, a treatment focused on these, which I'm not going to describe exactly how we did our therapy for prolonged grief disorder that we tested in the NIMH studies, um, but, it, but they were, it was essentially focused on these seven areas. And I'm going to suggest some ways that you know, that you can think about this even if you're not in the prolonged grief disorder therapy, if you don't, if you're not in a place, if a person isn't in a place where um, they can actually get that, or if, if there's a therapist that doesn't know how to do it yet, and um, there's still, this is still an approach. And, and then we're going to be, so we're going to be moving through those milestones and looking for identifying the, what we call now these derailers that we talked about earlier and addressing them. So active listening is the centerpiece of this because all bereaved people need to feel heard and we need to listen. And this is what any therapist, you would expect any therapist to do. And listening itself is often transformative. It is very important to listen in any therapy, but um, for any therapist to listen closely in any therapy, but it's especially important in grief, and it's especially true in grief that when we do this, there are times when when it really helps that natural adaptive process to kick in. But even transformative listening isn't enough when someone has prolonged grief disorder. So we provide a basically planned short, you can provide a planned short-term therapy that in essence, helps the bereaved person discover their own way. So we are doing something pretty structured, or at least sequenced, we, we like to call it, and with some planned sort of procedures that we do. But um, they, what they do is help the person discover their own way forward. So we're, we're going to, first of all, help, help the patient to understand grief in the way that we were talking about it a few minutes ago is the response to loss that's complex, multifaceted, and really can be understood as the death, as the a stress response, as a separation response, or I like to say the form love takes after someone we love dies, and a catalyst for adapting to loss that actually evolves as adaptation progresses. So it's kind of a back and forth or bi-directional relationship with adaptation. So we want, we want people to accept grief as natural after loss, to remember that it's that form of love and not to judge it or to try to make it, try to control it in any way, but rather to get to know it and allow grief a place in our life. So we, we have a procedure that we call grief monitoring where um, I'm going to show it to you in just a minute, where we help people see that grief actually does naturally wax and wane, even when it's intense, it will wax and wane over the course of a day. And that's a very natural 
kind of thing for it to do. And the oscillation between intense grief and kind of much less grief is helpful to the adaptation process. So judging grief, trying to avoid reminders, getting lost in trying to stay close, close to the person who died, smelling their clothes, looking at pictures, daydreaming about them, those kinds of things can get in the way of accepting the grief sometimes. And so can intense grief related emotions. So we help people manage those emotions by observing what they are, naming them, and again, not judging them, but looking at what might be activating them and reflecting on that and practicing, importantly, mindfulness and self-compassion. Self-compassion is very, very important. We also encourage people to share pain and troubling thoughts and let other people help. So that would be other people who want to help them in their own life. And there usually are such people around, but also it means us therapists. And, and the other important thing is that managing grief related emotions also means allowing oneself to experience positive emotions. And so there are the common impediments to watch for are also listed on this slide, but I'm going to go ahead and show you the grief monitoring, which is we, we ask people to, to take five minutes at the end of each day, and it really does take just five minutes. So you can take longer. If some people like to write more than we're asking them to write here, but it's very possible to do this in a short period of time. And that, that's important because when someone is grieving intensely, it takes up a lot of mental space. And so we can't ask people to do a whole lot more, but we do need to ask them to do some more things kind of at home in between um, therapy sessions. So we ask them to take five minutes at the end of the day to, to record two periods of grief intensity. So using a scale from one to 10, we ask them to record one time during the day when grief, to look back over the day and, and, and kind of identify one time during the day when grief was at its highest level for that day and rate how high that was on that scale from one to 10. So. You know, was it a 10? Was it the highest, um, the, the highest grief that the person has ever experienced? Or was it not quite that high? Was it a nine or an eight? Or was it a five? Or what was it was it that was the highest for that day? And what was happening at that time? So it might have been, you know, when, when the person was came home from work, that's a, a, a common time. If, if the person who died, for example, was a, a spouse or a partner, and then the person is out at work and they come home and of course the person isn't there it's a reminder just walking in the door is a reminder that they're not there and that can activate a very high level of grief for someone with prolonged grief disorder especially and then we ask them to do the same thing with the lowest level what what was the lowest level and what was happening at that time and very often that's that might be a time when the person again if this is a person who's working and they're working at a job that that is demanding and or a little bit interesting to them, then that could be the time when the grief was the lowest. Or it might be a time when they're playing with an, a pet or with children. Um, that often will, will be associated with lower levels of grief. And then we look at the overall level for the day. Was this a high, low, or moderate grief day? So they do that every day, and then we, we kind of have a way of reviewing this with them that really helps um, helps identify things that we can work with um, to help them accept grief and or uh, manage emotional pain and find and address some of those derailers. So the next thing we do is we, we encourage people to understand that their own life matters. Of course, it matters a lot that the person died, but their own life matters as well. And we wanna help them just begin to see a glimmer of hope in the future, to see a promising future. So we ask them, we work with them to take a little time to consider what's important and meaningful to them in their life. What do they care about? What, are they, what have they been interested in? And, and we do this by, um, by asking them to try to imagine what they would want for the, themselves if their grief wasn't so intense. And that's not an easy question to answer for someone who's experiencing prolonged grief, but it, it actually turns out to be helpful to start to talk about that. 
We also encourage them to experience and savor positive emotions, to plan to do something, just some small thing that's a little bit pleasant every day and make that into a kind of a ritual. So um, then, you know, in terms of the what's meaningful and important, we, we try to help them gradually think about a big long-term project that could be interesting, meaningful, or satisfying to them, and just to begin to, to plan how they might move forward on that. And again, some of the impediments are listed on this slide. The next thing we do is, is help people to strengthen their relationships with people who are still alive, to nurture social connections, which are almost always there, even though oftentimes when someone has prolonged grief disorder, people who have been trying to help, who really want to help, who really care about the person, have become frustrated and they might have withdrawn, they might have become harsh, they might be saying things like stop wallowing in your grief. Um, so we and so we want to sort of help that and these are some of the ways that we do that. Um, then we we encourage the person to share the story of the death and this of course is a difficult thing to do and we we still do it even though it's difficult we we do it in a way that we we basically invite the person to share that story because we we've learned over time that this is a very powerful and very important thing to do because we we all need to be able to tell that story to ourselves and it's often very helpful to be able to share it too and to be able to develop a coherent kind of narrative story a coherent story of what happened is what we see sometimes a way of making the unthinkable thinkable and it really helps enormously in that process to of, of really accepting the reality of what's happened and the other thing that helps with this is learning to live in a world of reminders which many people with prolonged grief disorder are really working hard to try to avoid those reminders so we don't we don't say okay you know we really want you to go out and do all those things that you're avoiding but rather we we set up a kind of process by which the person can gradually start to um, to do some of the things that they've been avoiding doing, to confront some of the situations that they have been kind of really either afraid to do or loath to do or just withdrawing from. And as they start to do this, again, most people find it really rewarding because most of the places that are reminders that the person is gone are places that they've been with with the person and so they contain a lot of really wonderful memories as well and lastly we work to help them restore that sense of connection which is there in their mind and in their body to the person who died and we do this with a series of questionnaires and also in our in our therapy we do it with a um, with an exercise of actually doing an imaginal conversation with the person who died. So that's the basic overview of the therapy that we do and we found it to be highly effective and we, we always compared in our, in our um, treatment studies we compared this approach to helping people this grief focused prolonged grief disorder therapy to a proven efficacious treatment for depression and in each case in all three of the studies we did we, we made that comparison and in all all three of them there was a very big and significant statistically significant difference between this therapy and the treatment for depression so takeaways from this talk are listed on this slide but i think i'm going to stop at this point because we're already um probably over time <laughs> and um and i don't know i guess we can this is where you can get more information. And I, I can take a few questions, um, Clara, if, if you want to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, 
There are there were a lot of questions throughout. Um, I'm gonna just address really quickly a couple of logistical questions that came up a few times. Sure. Um, so, uh, and particularly for folks who may have planned to uh, leave at 7 p.m. and may need yes. to go, um, you will receive a link to the recording after the event, the, which will not unfortunately include the Q&A, but you will have already received the, the slides and I'll include a link to the PDF of the slides in the follow-up email as well, so you'll have it twice. Um, so uh, yeah, there were a number of questions, so I will get right to them. Um, so, uh, if you 